Hello, can everyone hear me? Hello. Testing. Hello, everyone. Oh boy, oh boy, it's been another of those days. Another of those days in which technology hates me. I wanted to set up and read in my beautiful new reading nook, but the extension cord to my tripod camera isn't working. And now, for some reason, my keyboard's not working. I plugged in a new keyboard. It is also not working. It's just a cursed day, and I'm not allowed to type. I don't know why, but we're still going to read. Uh, hello, folks. Uh, Clement, to answer your question, don't worry. The backlog is not gone. It is moved to a streaming channel. So now you can watch all the old stuff on the Gaming Muse archives. If you Google it, it comes right up. Not everything is over there yet because it takes a long time to upload that shit, and I got tired. <laughs> I don't think all the vlogs are there. Uh, there are some longer RPGs I haven't uploaded but the goal is to have everything up there at some point. I'm keeping keeping up with it as much as I can. This is, of course, book readings, which I haven't done in a while. When I got really sick with anemia, I didn't know it at the time, uh, it became very hard to breathe, and the first thing that went out the window was book readings. It was so hard to do. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, but now I'm like, oh, that's why. So, for those who don't know, if you're new or you just never checked in, uh, I used to read books on the channel. You know how you do. Hello, Gandalf. Hey, buddy. Candy here for book? Yes, Candy here for book. Um, we have a lot of ongoing series, which I've not, uh, we've not started up again. I think May was the last time we continued those. We're not going to continue an, an one of those today because that'll be, I want to make this announcement that it's back so folks can join in. It won't always be this late. I just had a really rough morning. Um, so we're going to start something new today so that nobody's, like, behind, and we're going to read uh, a new book I just got the other day that I'm so excited about. Um, <laughs> yeah, technology doing the usual backstabbing. Hello, Lobsil, Dexmex, Clement, Abigail, Snake, uh, Paul, hello, hello. Kind of surprised we have so many folks, because this is not my usual time. I know lots of folks do stream later in the evening, and... There are plenty of people across the planet in various time zones. I've just always been a morning person. I don't know. I've, I've been having more t trouble sleeping. So now I'm like switching back to being a night person like I was in high school. Ah, the mysteries of time. What are we reading today? We are reading Golden Terrace. Um, you might know it by some other titles if you read Chinese web novels because uh, it was originally fan translated as a different title. I don't remember what it was. Um, this is an official English translation of a Chinese web novel. It's been fully released in its entirety. You can read the whole story. No waiting for the next part. Two parts were released simultaneously by... Uh, something... What's the... Peach Flower House Books. They're fantastic. They have a couple of different books, web novels they've published. This is the only one that's really in my wheelhouse because it's historical Chinese gay drama. And you know that's my shit. This is enemies to lovers, politics, war, Chinese history, gay guys. It's everything I love. I've already read part of it many, many years ago when it was still an unofficially translated fan project. And I really enjoyed what I read of it then. But it was really hard to follow all the politics. Eventually I fell off of it and just didn't finish it. And by the time 
uh, time had passed, I heard there was an official translation coming. So I was like, I, I gotta wait and, and read the whole thing when it's finally out. So uh, I thought it'd be neat to read it together, and I can hopefully, for folks that are interested in this kind of thing, but maybe find it hard to follow along, I can kind of help. Um, it is, I believe, in a fictional history. It's kind of based on some real Chinese history, but it's not, like, about real people or real events. You know what I mean? Like, you can probably find some parallels. There were some wars and some folks, you know. But it's not going to be like you could Google this dude and he was a real person. So, Golden Terrace by San Wu Bin Bai. I will do my best with pronunciations. I may be a little rusty since it's been a minute. Um, let's make sure we're up here. Good. I don't have any music today because, again, technical difficulties. My keyboard's not working. Next time, we'll maybe have some music. Um, here, let me maybe move towards the microphone. The book is in front of the microphone. There we go. In the 25th year of Great Zhou Yuantai's era, the Eastern Tartars invaded the northern regions. The Beiyan Cavalry, the Border Guard, mustered at the Wuding River with the forces of the provinces of Ningzhou and Tongzhou and inflicted a crushing defeat on the Eastern Tartars' troops, driving them back over several hundred li and retaking the Xichou Pass. Li is like Chinese miles. It's not a one-to-one, -one, but it's a distance. Um, and the Tartar... I don't know if I'm saying Tartar right. I'm saying it's like it's Tartar sauce, but it's spelled the same way. So maybe they're the ones... Maybe they invented Tartar sauce. I don't know. In the eighth month of the same year, the Eastern Tartar Uji tribe be begged to surrender and submit to the authority of Great Zhou, becoming a vassal state, and pay yearly tribute. On the sixteenth day of the eighth month, envoys of both sides completed a ceremony of surrender on the banks of the Wuding River, arranging that the Uji would pay a tribute of furs, medicinal ingredients, horses, gold, and silver, and such like, and send the Khan's son to this capital to study Central Plains etiquette at the Imperial Academy. So the Tartars are like, uh, sort of where Mongolia is, I believe. So they're probably a Mongolian tribe, and the, the Zhou dynasty is like China, central China. So this is like China, and the Mongolians are having a war, and then there's one tribe from Mongolia like, hey, we'd like to not war now, can we be part of China? And China's like, yeah, that's cool, you can be part of China. In the ninth month, the court issued a decree commanding the Beiyan Calvary's commander, the Marquis of Jinning Fu Shen, to escort the Eastern Tartar's diplomatic mission to the capital to be presented at court. Now, if you can't follow all the long titles and stuff, uh, this is one of our main characters. His name is Fu Shen. His title is Marquis of Jinning Fu Shen. Hostility, hostilities had just been settled, and the Uji had withdrawn beyond the pass. Fu Shen had no fear of leaving trouble behind him for the time being, so he ordered his subordinate Yuan Huan to return to the northern border with their main force, while he personally led a team of elite cavalry to escort the diplomatic mission south. On the ninth day of the ninth month, the, the diplomatic mission was passing through the Qing Shop Gap when they suddenly sensed the ground start to tremble. The cliffs on both sides collapsed with a rumble. Stones rained down, horses took fright and bolted. In the rush, the carriage of the Eastern Tartar's youngest prince had no time to dodge. It was smashed to pieces by a huge boulder dropping out of the sky. The terrain of the Qingxia Gap was steep and narrow, but it was situated within Great Zhou and had always been peaceful. Don't you love how there's always narrow canyons that have to be navigated in political stories? They always have to go through a narrow canyon. They should stop doing that. That's where they always set the traps. <sighs> Reasonably speaking, there shouldn't have been an ambush. On the way, while Fu Shen had remained alert and taken precautions, he had never thought there would be a cataclysmic disaster like this on his own doorstep. At first, he had no attention to spare for the eldest princes or youngest ones. Seeing fallen stones rolling towards him from up ahead, he decisively turned his horse's head, gave a loud cry of retreat, and led the way in a charge back to the entrance they had come in by. Smoke and dust filled the air, nearly dyeing the whole valley the color of sand. Amid a thicket in the heights, an elaborate crossbow mechanism turned. The coldly gleaming sinister arrowhead took precise aim at the Beiyan commander as he urged his horse into a mad gallop. Keen instincts tempered on the battlefield saved him in this moment of imminent peril. The crossbow bolt streaked toward him. 
As if he had eyes on the back of his head, Fu Shen flattened himself while yanking on the reins. The cavalry horse came to a sudden halt, its front hooves rising high and turned a half-circle in place, narrowly avoiding that deadly cold bolt. The arrowhead skimmed past his back, then buried itself with a clang half an inch deep in the cliff face and was immediately drowned in rolling sand and rock. Who? Who was trying to kill him? This ice-cold thought only flashed through Fu Shen's mind for a moment. The next instant, the shouts of his personal guards around him pulled him back to the human world. General, look out! The boulder, falling from overhead, blotted out the sky and completely cut off his backward look. On the ninth day of the ninth month, in the twenty-fifth year of the Wan y Yuan Tai era, the Eastern Tartar's diplomatic mission was attacked in Tongzhou's Qingxia Gap. The Eastern Tartar's youngest prince perished on the spot, and the better half of the diplomatic mission party was lost. The Marquis of Jinning Fu Shen, who had come to escort the diplomatic mission, had his legs crushed by a boulder and was gravely injured. He was taken back to the northern border through the night by trusted bodyguards. While he survived by a stroke of luck, he was unlikely to make a full recovery. Word was sent back to the capital. It threw the court and the commons into an uproar. At all levels of society, no one was unshaken. Emperor Yuantai was furious. He issued an imperial edict commanding the three judicial chiefs, chief ministries to strictly investigate this case, then issued a special decree giving generous compensation to Fu Shen. To the Marquis of Jinying's original official salary, he added 1,000 shi, moved to confer upon him the title of General Defender of the Nation, bestowed a purple ribbon and golden seal, and permitted him to continue to hold his command while he returned to the capital to recover. The capital was abuzz with the news of Fu Shen's injury. Quite a few people had been making guesses in private as to whose hands the command of the Bayon Bayon Cal Alvar they call it Bayon Army and Bayon Cavalry. Bayon Army this time would fall into now that he had been injured. The Emperor's special decree temporarily silenced the multitudinous mouths. His command remained. He was only temporarily leaving the North. If General Fu were sufficiently clever and tactful, he would understand the kind intentions involved when he heard the tune, and after returning to the capital, would give up his command in favor of someone more qualified, handing it over to His Majesty, his legs in exchange for a life of glory and splendor. It would seem, then, that His Majesty, not merely doing all that humanity and duty called upon him to do for a heroic subject, might even be said to be giving him rather preferential treatment. The Marquis of Jinning, who was at the center of this gossip, received the imperial decree along with the Bayan army, but he made no move. Only at the end of the ninth month did Fu Shen send a memorial to the throne detailing arrangements for handing over military affairs at the northern border garrisons and requesting the emperor to permit him to relinquish his post and convalesce. At this memorial to the throne, Emperor Yuan, Yuan this sound is very hard to make and I often struggle with it, Yuan Tai breathed a sigh of relief. According to convention, he refused the resignation request and granted Fu Shen permission to depart the north and return to the capital. Many people in the capital were counting the days on their fingers and looking out expectantly, waiting to see what this Marquis of Jin Ning, famed for his military prowess, had become. Meanwhile, thousands of Li away at twilight, a small carriage left heavily guarded Yanzhou City under the escort of bodyguards, speeding in the direction of the capital. Let's backtrack. What happened in here? So Mongolia and China are at war. Basically, the Tartars and the Central Han, the Central, the Zhou Dynasty are at war. And one tribe of the northern folk, the I think they said the Chia, I don't remember the name. They want peace, so they said, "Hey, can we become part of China? We will do peace with you." and make tribute and such, and you don't kill us anymore. And China was like, cool. And they sent the uh, general of their northern border, so the guy that makes sure they're safe from invasion from the north, which happened a lot back then, uh, he went and met the folks and said, hey, cool, you can come, you know, do a peace with us now. And the peace tribe, peace offering, like the, what do you call it, mission, the diplomatic mission traveled with him, and they went through a narrow canyon. You never do that in a political story. You're always going to get crushed by rocks, and that's what happened. They were crushed by rocks. But in the middle of being crushed by rocks, an arrow tried to shoot General Fu Shen, 
And it is uh, obviously what Fu Shen has realized. This whole thing was a cover to kill him. That's who was the real target of this mission. Um, his legs get crushed, but he does live. And word is spread. Everybody's like, oh my god, the great general Fu Shen, oh no. And the emperor says, you know, oh, I will not, you know, I honor him. And, and he will get to stay, commander, kind of, you know, being polite. And Fu Shen, realizing this is all politics, is like, no, I'll step down. Oh no, no, you can keep your stand. Oh no. Clearly, you know, politically, everyone is trying to be polite and do the uh, thing that looks good. But in reality... A general with no legs cannot be a general in their eyes, and they want him to step down, and obviously someone wants him dead. So then at the very end there, a uh, carriage is leaving a city and heading towards the capital, implying it is Fu Shen returning home, uh, and we're going to find out what happens to him. But first, I'm going to find out where I put my water bottle before I sat down uh, without it, like a dummy. For those hopping in, this is a uh, fictional uh, Chinese, like, historical, political story. At the heart of it is a romance between two former rivals in the political court. One is the noble, honorable gen general who always must do right. The other is the backstabbing political guy. And uh, they both kind of end up investigating this mystery together. It's quite fun. Chapter 1. Going south from Yanzhou, they passed through Guanyang, Baitan, and other such places until they reached Miyun, at which point the capital city hove into view in the distance. The weather was chilly with the coming of autumn. In the north, the first snow had already fallen, but in the vicinity of the capital, it was still pleasantly cool, perfectly suited for travel. As midday approached, a team of fine riders came along the public road. The lead rider raised his eyes and looked into the distance from his elevated position. He saw a tea kiosk by the side of the road, then gently pulled up his reins, slowing. When the carriage behind him had caught up, he leaned down, knocked twice on the carriage's wooden slats, and requested instruction. General, we've been going away all night. Why don't we stop and rest, then continue on our way? A slit opened in the carriage's curtains. A man's deep voice floated out, accompanied by the scent of bitter medicine. Is there a place up ahead to take refreshment? If so, we should stop here to catch our breath. The men have had a hard time of it. The man accepted the order. The whole party galloped toward the tea kiosk up ahead, sending clouds of dust flying where they passed, drawing sidelong glances from travelers stopped by the side of the road to rest. This team of riders bore no banner. They all wore narrow-sleeved, cross-collared military robes of green, each with a vigorous figure, grand and austere. Though they had not made their identities known, the words not to be trifled with were written clear as day across their faces. The proprietor of the tea kiosk had weathered many hardships over the years. He was used to seeing people come and go, and he said no more than was needed. The lead rider dismounted and offered an ingot of silver, then ordered his subordinates to go have some tea and rest. He himself, meanwhile, found a table in the shade, wiped it clean, and instructed the proprietor to prepare hot tea and several kinds of refreshments. Then he turned and went outside, where he helped a white-faced, frail young gentleman who looked like a chronic invalid out of the carriage. This gentleman's footsteps were insubstantial. He had a sickly look and could only walk with someone lending him an arm. It took him an age to shuffle over the small distance between the carriage and the tea kiosk. When he finally sat down at the table, he coughed repeatedly, as though his body couldn't have stood further strain. The other customers sitting under the awning actually breathed a sigh of relief for him when they sat down. Just watching him made them feel worn out. Strange to say, while that man looked like he might breathe his last at any moment, he had an indescribable air about him that made it impossible to take one's eyes off him. He had an outward form that could be picked out at 10,000 li, though his was not the type of elegance beloved of contemporaries, of a man with a face like a beautiful woman, gentle as spring flowers. Instead, he had well-drawn brows and phoenix eyes, a high nose and thin lips, an appearance that exuded keenness and bitter cold. The man was very tall. As if accustomed to looking down at others, his eyelids were half-lowered. He brimmed all over with careless languor. He was also wasted down to a handful of ailing bones. It seemed that even the tea kiosk's somewhat heavy coarse porcelain bowl would snap his wrist with its weight. So this is uh, our poor Fu Shen who has been so badly injured. He's very, he's gone from being the general warlord to an invalid. Uh, part of what really drew me to this story at first was the fact that one of the main characters is like chronically disabled. 
you know, <laughs> like I've been there. <laughs> I've not had rocks fall on my legs, but you know, I, I really uh, enjoy how this story deals with that element of his character, especially coming from a warrior background. But when he sat upright, his gaunt back was perfectly straight, like a stalk of bamboo sticking out of the earth, a sword that had faced fire and been tempered in water, whose chill blade, though riddled with scars, could still drink blood. A feeble body in no way prevented him from looking with scorn upon all around him, marching through the world unhindered. The merchants traveling on foot couldn't resist craning their necks, just like a gaggle of rapidly focused geese. This continued until the young gentleman, after slowly drinking a bowl of tea, put the porcelain bowl down on the table with a clatter. Gentlemen, your necks are all stretched long enough to be used to tie up donkeys. Well, am I that good looking? <laughs> the vigorous man, eating and drinking beside him, gave a shudder upon hearing this. Among the geese, some averted their gaze resentfully, while a few unusually avid ones actually came up to make conversation. Where did you come from, sir? Are you going to the capital? Xiao Shun, who had been closely waiting upon this master, felt his scalp go numb, ready to hang the speaker from the tree outside if the young man so much as said scram. But who would have thought that this exceedingly standoffish-seeming gentleman would be unexpectedly lenient? He answered mildly, I came from Yanzhou City in the north, heading to the capital to seek medical treatment. Their party was dressed informally, not wearing swords, and the carriage wasn't in a very grand style. While the guards were overbearingly lofty, the gentlemen in charge wore clothes of ordinary color and cut, which did not appear to be fashionable in the style of the capital. The traveling merchants guessed they were perhaps the traveling party of the young master of some wealthy family in Yanjo. Because Yanjo City was a strategically important location for the defense of the frontier, its customs were aggressive. It was really common to travel with a retinue that came from military backgrounds. In a chance encounter with a stranger, the traveling merchants couldn't very well inquire directly about his illness, so they turned to speaking of another novel affair. Since you came from the north, sir, did you happen to encounter General Fu's carriage setting out? He is returning home in glory. What splendor he must be traveling in! Xiao Shun nearly choked on his tea. The, general, the young gentleman raised his long brows and asked with interest... General Fu. The same General Fu I'm thinking of. Naturally, who apart from the Marquis of Jin Ning has such a glorious reputation? The young gentleman seemed to develop an enthusiasm for the conversation. He pursued, It seems to me that you are quite well informed about General Fu. Certainly not, certainly not, his interlocutor said, waving a hand. We merchants who travel up and down the country often hear news of General Fu on the road. In the years he has defended the northern regions, the roads have been at peace. Business has been immeasurably easier to do than before. Even when the common people in the capital speak of General Fu, it was without exception with admiration. You wouldn't know it. Last year, when General Fu led the Bayon Cavalry in putting the Tartars to rout, I was coming back from buying furs in the north, and the avenues and alleys were all abuzz, everyone saying, With Commander Fu in the north, the capital can sleep easy. The stories told in the tea shops, the songs sung in the streets, the performances staged in the opera houses, they were all about him and his heroics. The magnificent reputation of the Bayon army and the Marquess of Jin Ning could be seen from this small example. Hello, folks joining us. We are reading a Chinese historical political gay drama. We've only just started, but you'll catch on. Uh, General Fu, our main character, is injured in battle. He's coming home to, uh, to heal and discover why his, someone has betrayed him and led to his injury. The Bayan Calvary was known as Great Zhou's line of defense at the northern border. Since its establishment, it had been controlled by the Fu family. Its earlier form had been a border garrison led by the Duke of Ying, Fu Jian. To the people of the Central Plains, the traveling herdsmen who ruled the grasslands to the north were known as the Tartars. Decades ago, the Tartars had experienced internecine strife followed by a schism. As far as I know, this part's actually real history. A portion of the tribes were forced to move west, where they had dealings and intermarried with the Hu, the Sogja, and other peoples of the western regions. They came to be known as the Western Tartars. Another portion, meanwhile, occupied the central and easter portions of the grasslands, and which were comparatively fertile. They were known as the Eastern Tartars. Twenty-three years ago, when Emperor Yuantai, Sun Shun, had ascended the throne, the Eastern Tartar tribes had started an, an outrageous invasion of Great Zhou. 
The border forces of the time were weak and folded at a single attack, while the Tartars had a strong military. They cut through the defenses like splitting bamboo. They plundered and massacred without restraint in the north, even turning Xuanqing and Baoning, two strategically important border points, into ghost towns with their slaughter. During the emperor's reign, during the previous emperor's reign, there had been a lengthy period of peace and prosperity, over thirty years without war. No one had thought the eastern Tartars would come south in command of an army, and it had been even more unthinkable that the border forces would be unable to stand up to a single clash with them, letting the enemy reach their gates in the blink of an eye. Voices in court advocating for peace talks grew louder and louder, but Emperor Wantai, at the time in the prime of his life, utterly unwilling as the lord of the celestial empire to bow his head before mere barbarians. Fujian happened to have been transferred from the south to Ganzhou due to his meritorious service, so Emperor Wantai promoted him to military commissioner of Ganzhou and commanded him to lead the forces of the three provinces of Ganzhou, Ningzhou, and Yuanzhou to resist the eastern Tartars. If you can't follow this, I'll explain. Uh, let me finish this paragraph. Over the course of two years, Fu Jian and his two sons, along with the officers under their command, assembled a force of a hundred thousand and eliminated the Tartars inside the pass. Fu Jian's oldest son, Fu Ting Zhong, even went past the Great Wall, leading his troops straight into the heart of the grasslands, nearly conquering the eastern Tartars' capital, failing only because Fu Jian died of illness midway. Following this campaign, Fu Jian was posthumously given the title the Duke of Ying, General Pillar of the Nation. Fu Ting Zhong was inherited the title Duke of Ying and control over the military affairs of the provinces of Ganzhou, Ningzhou, and Yuanzhou. The second son, Fu Tinxin, Tinxin, was given the title of General Defender of the Nation and control of the military affairs of Yanzhou and Yozhou. Together, these two built for Great Zhou an iron line of defense on the northern border. The border forces led by the Fu family came to be known as the Beiyan Cavalry. So long story short, in the north, Tartars. In the south, central plains. They fight a lot. The Tartars at one point invade and do a lot of damage, and the emperor's like, what the fuck? Don't do that. And he sends this guy named General Fu, and General Fu does such a good job of kicking their ass that he, like, he and his kids build this army in the north that just, like, keeps them out for, like, a whole decade. And so they become really well-known, and they inherit a title, and they become the Fu family. And so this army, the Bayon Cavalry, has been defending the north for so long, and the Fu family keeps it in their line. And our newest, our hero, Fu Shen, is the youngest, the, the now in charge of that army. And he's the same guy that got injured in that, that earlier scene. So... Long story short, he is the son of this family that defends the north. From the sixth year of Yuan Tai to the eighteenth year of Yuan Tai, over a decade, with the deterrent of the Beiyan cavalry, the eastern Tartars went into temporary hibernation. The border was at peace. No major hostilities arose. This lasted until the 19th year of Yuan Tai, when Fu Tingzhong was killed by Eastern Tartar assassins, and the Eastern Tartars allied with the northern border's Zhe, Zhe clan. I may be saying that wrong. I believe it's Zhe. Z-H-E. Zhe. Zhe clan to once again invade Great Zhou. Fu Tingxing led an isolated force deep into the enemy's encirclement and ultimately died on the battlefield. There was nearly a reenactment of the enemy host reaching the city gates, but unlike in the previous instances, the court now did not have so many elite soldiers and able generals at its disposal, and Emperor Wan Tai was no longer as resolute and enterprising as he'd been in his younger years. The war faction and the peace faction argued several times in morning court and at last came to the silliest, yet also the most sagacious decision. They put forward Fu Tingzhong's eldest son, Fu Shen, who was not yet of age for the capping ceremony and pushed him onto the battlefield. So over the years, what happens? Uh, what happens? The Fu family's been defending the North for, gener for like multiple generations, but unfortunately, fate turns and the whole family's basically dead, except for this one teenager. And so the emperor looks at this 15-year-old and says, get out there, <laughs> you go, lead the army, <laughs> and the, sends the kid out. And somehow it works for them because Fu Shen is a badass. 
The Eastern Tartars had a bitter hatred for the Fu family, and they had come on this expedition in order to get revenge. It was up to the one who had made the mess to clean it up. Moreover, Fu Shen had been among the army alongside his father and uncle since he was young. It was said that Fu Tinxing often remarked with emotion that there is a worthy successor in the next generation. So strictly speaking, he ought to count as command material. The reason seemed abundant, but looking back on past dynasties, when, it had, when had it ever been right for ministers who did nothing but eat all day to hole up at the rear while making a teenager go ahead to face the jackals and tigers? And there we come to one of the heart of this, this story, the, you know, the politicians hiding behind the walls and throwing, you know, lower class people at the enemy to be traumatized and, and disabled and murdered. Great luck came amid great misfortune. The Fu family perhaps really was a den of stars of command, collectively reincarnated. Fu Shen outshone his predecessors. He had an exceptional genius for military command. The northern frontier was in a state of emergency. Reinforcements could only be requested from nearby Tangzhou and Tongzhou. But when Fu Shen, Fu Shen was put forward, he didn't count on obtaining help from his own people. He gathered the Beiyan cavalry and met with the Zhe clan's main force at Yanzhou's three passes, and with the inducement of opening trade routes and permitting them to join the empire, borrowed the cavalry of the western Tartars' Ye Liang tribe and outflanked the Tartar Zhe allied forces, dividing and crushing them. Long story short, he went to the enemy of his enemy and said, Hey, enemy of my enemy, want to be friends and fight the enemy? And they did that, and he won. After the battle, the Ye Leong tribe joined the empire, and its cavalry mixed with the Beiyan cavalry. Giving as his reason that the front was too long, making it inconvenient to maneuver, Fu Shen returned command of the border forces of the three provinces of Ganzhou, Ningzhou, and Yozhou to the center, concentrating on operating the frontier defenses of Yuanzhou and Yanzhou. I think I said those two is the same. The, there's a subtle difference, but I have trouble... It should be one more like a W noise. Uh, still learning. Following the battle of the three passes, Fu Shen formally took up the post of command of the Beiyan cavalry and was granted the title of Marquis of Jinning. Long story short, he rocks. He's great at military stuff and everyone loves him. Also, for some reason, I just realized the chat viewer is not working. Why do you hate me, technology? Why do you hate me? I'll look at why that's not working later. I don't care right now. Alas. Given the merit Fu Shen had won, working to save that desperate situation, remember, he's like 15, it would have been fitting and proper for him to inherit the rank of Duke, but Emperor Yuan Tai wavered, and in utter despite of the system passed down by his predecessors, not only permitted the third son of the Fu family to take his nephew's place in inheriting the title of Duke of Shen, Duke of Yin, Ying, I read that wrong, but even gave his tacit consent to Fu Shen, leaving the Duke of Ying Manor to reside elsewhere. So what happened there? This comes into more detail later, so I don't know, it's a little hard to explain right now, but basically, uh, he kind of snubbed him because of politics, and he didn't get a title, his, like, I think his, like, cousin or some, the, some his half-brother, I think, gets the title instead of him, and Fu Shen leaves the house of his family and moves into his own house to live alone, you find out why later. He doesn't like his family. The discerning could all see that his majesty was scared of the Fu family, worried lest that family should produce a Duke of Ying that would be remembered throughout the ages. In other words, he was afraid of how popular and strong these guys were getting. But some people were doomed to sail against the current. In a few short years, while the Marquis of Jinning Fu Shen held command over the Beiyan cavalry, he became the mainstay of Great Zhou in a single leap, refusing to pass on the responsibility he was called upon to fill, firmly occupying the position of a thorn in the flesh of the Tartars and the Zhe. The northern border had been peaceful in recent years, the people of the north living and working in peace and contentment. The best part of this was owed to his contribution. So long as Fu Shen remained in the army, even if he sat there unmoving and acted as a mascot, he was the greatest deterrent to the other peoples of the north. While the common people blew hot air, the young gentleman at first listened as though it were a joke. But when he heard the capital can sleep easy, all trace of a smile disappeared. Let me explain real quick. Uh... Since we just did a lot of history, if you did, if you joined us in the middle of all that history, that was a flashback. Uh, our main character, Fu Shen, is sitting in a tea house, listening to a bunch of the common folk talk about how awesome Fu Shen is and how much they love him. 
they don't know that they're talking to Fu Shen because he's traveling undercover because he is injured. He's going home to recover from having boulder fall on him, itis. <sighs> Xiao Shun saw him lost in thought, that's his assistant, and quickly snatched up the teapot, pouring more tea for him. Deliberately interrupting, he said, Jen, young master, we have to get back on the road in the afternoon. Take some more refreshment. The gentleman came back to himself. He picked up his bowl and sipped the hot tea. The corners of his mouth lifted. Unexpectedly, there was a bit of ridicule in his smile. To himself, he feelingly remarked, If these words spread, how many people will lose sleep? Aw, thank you, Onyx Phoenix. I'm glad you enjoy my work. Uh, let's see. A customer next to them wearing a bamboo hat had been drawn in by their conversation. With a mysterious manner, he interjected, People often say utmost strength is followed by disgrace. Utmost prosperity must lead to decline. Don't you think, after so many years of doing battle in the north, the Marquis of Jinning perfectly suits those words. The famous generals of the past were either short-lived or solitary, because they were all stars of command come to the mortal world, their lives ruled by battle, unlike ordinary people. As I see it, the Marquis of Jinning was likely born under the Qisha star. His legs may be the consequence of too much murder. There was a crisp snap as the bowl in Xiao Shun's hand broke into several pieces. Blood dripped from the cracks between his fingers. Everyone looked in the direction of the sound. They were completely astounded. For a time, the inside of the tea kiosk was so quiet it was embarrassing. Your grip is too strong. I'll buy you an iron rice bowl next time to keep you from wrecking things. The young gentleman's expression hadn't changed one bit. Indifferently, he said, Go dress those wounds yourself. Don't forget to pay for the damage. Xiao Shen lowered his head and gave an assent. The conversation that had been interrupted by this interlude could not continue. However colorful the speaker's description of immortals descending to earth, the speech had not been proprietous. Pro pro propitious. Now I can't say English words. I have a college English degree. This time a tea bowl had broken. Next time, perhaps, he would be surrounded and given a beating. The only one who seemed to want to fan the flames was that out-of-place gentleman. Smiling, he said, Interesting. According to what you say, friend, either a short life or solitude must fall upon such people. Since the Marquis of Jin Ning is already crippled, it would seem he will be able to find himself a wife soon. Xiao Shun was taken aback. Remember, this is Fu Shen talking about himself, even though the normal folks around him don't know. Someone banged on the table and leapt up in anger. How can a good man have the misfortune to be without a wife? A hero like the Marquis of Jin Ning can have any kind of woman he wants. Right, well said, another person said in agreement. And if he prefers men, there are plenty of good men out there waiting to marry him. The tea kiosk instantly erupted into earth-shaking laughter. The previous dynasty had treated marriage between men as a refinement, so while the great Zhou dynasty prohibited common men from marrying each other, there was no such taboo for noble nobles. There was even precedent for the emperor conferring a marriage between men. As a notable wealthy bachelor of the capital, the Marquis of Jing Ning was the man of many noble girls' dreams. Yet time had dragged on and no marriage had been settled for him. Hence, some had guessed that he had unusual interests. This also has historical precedent. It's not a one-to-one, -one, but there was a time when uh, everybody could marry whoever, and then later the emperor took it back and was like, okay, only noble dudes can marry dudes. Common folk can't marry each other. There, there's some real history there. Also some foreshadowing about uh, even the emperor can assign men to marry each other. Ho, ho, ho. Once this romantic subject was mentioned, everyone became more engrossed in conversation. The young gentleman did not interject again, only quietly listened to them discussing the Marquis of Jin Ning's whole life, a smile lingering at the corner of his, of his lips the whole time, as if he were listening to an extremely interesting, extremely splendid story. After a long silence, Xiao Shen prompted him, Jen, young master, midday has passed. Shall we go? Hmm? We shall. The young gentleman extended a hand so Xiao Shun could help him up. He indolently cupped his hands in salute toward the crowd of traveling merchants. Friends, I am in a hurry to reach the capital, so I will be going on ahead. 
Everyone raised their hands to bid him farewell. Shaoshun helped him into the carriage and lowered the curtains. When the carriage and the horses had trundled several hundred paces forward, Shaoshun heard him say from inside, Chongshan, give me the medicine. But didn't Mr. Du tell you to take the medicine an hour in advance? Shaoshun took an exquisite purse from his clothes. It contained an eggshell porcelain bottle. We, w we won't be entering the capital for another four hours. Don't talk nonsense. A hand reached out from under the curtains and snatched the porcelain bottle away. The capital barracks are up ahead. We can pull one over on these ordinary people, but we're sure to be recognized when we reach the capital barracks. When will I find the time to start playing lame then? Xiao Shun muttered. But sir, you're actually lame to begin with. The sickly gentleman, the same Marquis of Jinning, Fu Shen, spoken of by everyone, whose life was ruled by battle, threw back his head and swallowed a finger-sized brown pill. Sneering, he shed, said, Chongshan, between a general with hope for recovery and a completely crippled invalid, what do you think is most likely to make people lose sleep? Xiao Shun said nothing more. Fu Shen passed the porcelain bottle back to him and closed his eyes to await the paralysis about to spread through his limbs. Softly, he said, let's go. So what's going on there? There's some politics going on here. We learned in chapter one during the ambush, someone is trying to kill Fu Shen. They only managed to disable him instead, but uh, he is been badly injured. But not as badly injured as rumor says. He's pretending his legs are completely dead. In fact, he can walk. He is not fully, completely disabled, but he's taking a medicine that makes it look like he's more injured than he is for reasons. Ho ho. Chapter 2 Evening, at the western outskirts capital barracks, a hundred li outside the capital. Zhang He, commander of the Rufong ba barracks, came out in person to greet their party. Xiao Shun stepped forward to salute him. Before he'd completed his salute, Zhang He had already cast him aside. He leapt impatiently toward the carriage and lowered himself to make obeisance. Obse Why am I having more trouble with English words? Obseance. This subordinate, commander of the Rufang barracks, Zhang He, pays his respects to General Fu. The Rufang barracks ranked as the head of the five major capital barracks. Zhang He was a third-class officer, already a very high position, but his attitude toward the Marquis of Jingning was respectful in the extreme. A hand wrapped in bandages pushed out onto the hanging curtains. A dense medicinal odor slowly wafted out. Fu Shen wore no armor. He had only draped a robe over himself. His chest and arms were covered in bandages, and a blanket that hung down to his feet lay over his legs. His face was pale, his lips colorless, his hair loose. He seemed to be living on a single breath, so frail that a wind would knock him over. Fu Shen nodded in greeting. Commander Zhang, I trust you have been well since we last parted. Pardon me. <coughs> I find it difficult to move and cannot rise to greet you. Zhang He had already heard that he'd been gravely injured and couldn't walk, but he hadn't expected his injuries to be this grave. Originally, he hadn't especially credited the rumors that Fu Shen really is crippled, but seeing it with his own eyes, there was no room for disbelief. With Fu Shen's current appearance, never mind recovering his original condition, it seemed that even living steadily on for some years presented a problem. Why did my southern just pop out? Zhang He's vision darkened. He felt chilled from head to foot. In his sorrow, even the form of address he used changed. Jin Yuan, your injuries, you... Fu Shen heard his voice trail off with a tremor, the rims of his eyes turning red, as if Fu Shen hadn't simply been injured, but was about to depart this mortal world the next moment. The corners of Fu Shen's lips twitched irresistibly. With a sigh, he said, Thank you for your solicitude, Commander Zhang. It really is only my legs that are injured. It isn't fatal. Ah, Chong Shen, go get an, a handkerchief. Help Commander Zhang wipe away those tears. Zhang He had served in the Yuanzhou army in his earlier years and had been acquainted with Fu Tin Zhang and Fu Tin Xing. Really, he was halfway to being Fu Shen's family elder. Unfortunately, since assuming control over the Beiyan cavalry, Fu Shen had always dawdled in the north, unwilling to return. His exchanges with old friends of his father's generation had declined by degrees. But now, gravely injured, thin and pallid, his appearance made Zhang He all of a sudden put aside his position and remember only the high-spirited boy who in former years had always trailed after Fu Tin Shen in the army. Further considering he was all alone in the world, with his parents dead and no children to look after him, without even an intimate beside him to assist him, with a disability that was unlikely to heal at such a young age, Zhang He felt sadness welling up. 
It's all because of our incompetence. We couldn't prevent you from going out on the battlefield back then, which has led to the current disaster. How will I face your father and your uncle in the netherworld? Commander Zhang, Fu Shen, pained, leaned against the carriage wall. Let us not mention events that have already passed. I am well. There is no need for you to be overly grieved. From beginning to end, he'd always refused to call him uncle. Zhang He was on the one hand dejected, and on the other hand felt Fu Shen really was hard-hearted. It was already late, and Fu Shen's party was in a hurry to enter the capital, so the two of them now bid farewell. The Beiyan riders changed horses and continued their gallop toward the capital, just barely entering the city before the gates were closed. So, long story short, that's an old friend of his father's he hasn't seen in a long time, and the guy's, like, really upset that clearly he really is as, as injured as he was said to be. The last time Fu Shen had come back had been three months ago. The capital hadn't changed at all. As before, there were lights, liveliness, and bustle everywhere. The Beiyan soldiers traveling with him, however, went to the capital very rarely. They were constantly looking around as they walked, their progress slowing bit by bit. The sight of them walking down the street was truly too eye-catching. Fu Shen thought about it, then beckoned Xiao Shen over and quietly instructed, "'Take me back to the manor now, and then take them out for a stroll. "'No whoring, no gambling, no making trouble, "'and record the expenses on my account. "'Go on.' "'Xiao Shen opposed this without so much as thinking about it. "'How could we?' "'Do as I say.' "'Fu Shen's energy seemed to be waning. "'His voice was very low. "'But he spoke so insolently it made one's hands itch to give him a beating. "'Xiao Chan Chang, if you keep hovering around me, "'you'll destroy my reputation.' If I can't get married, you'll be the one acting the filial son at my bedside in the future. I... Xiao Shen couldn't win against this blackguard general. All he could do was give a sheepish assent. Passing through a small alley, they came to a tidy street. This area was full of the mansions of the meritorious and wealthy. All lofty pavilions in vivid cinnabar paint, imposing in bearing, more tranquil than the houses of ordinary people. The Marquis of Jingning's manor was situated at the corner, at the northeast corner. The old servant minding the house took down the threshold and welcomed the carriage through the gate. The servants waited in the courtyard. Seeing their master carried out on his subordinate's back, they all kept their hands to themselves and stood hesitating, not daring to step forward. Fu Shen had moved out of the Duke of Ying Manor to live in a part, uh, to live apart as soon as he'd been made a Marquis. He had no care at all for this big house. The servants were all weak and elderly ones that his stepmother, Madame Chin, had gathered from among her household and sent here for him to use. This had been four or five years ago. Fu Shen was often away, and there was no affection between him and the servants. Whenever he managed to return home for a brief stay, these people would be like mice seeing a cat, cowering away in the rear kitchen in the servants' quarters. Unless it was unavoidable, they wouldn't come out to obstruct his view. So... In ancient China, you live with your family, a long extended family. The, the head of household is like dad or granddad, depending on the generation and who's alive. So moving out of that house is not normal. It, it means like a severing, like he's not part of the family, technically, sort of. He he's technically is, but not really. And on, at the same time, the servants in the household that he lives in don't know him or care about him. He, like They're painting this picture of him as a very, very lonely very isolated person, and now that he's been injured and turned on, you know, clearly he, he needs he needs backup. Luckily, while the servants feared him, they hadn't neglected the housework. Xiao Shun carried Fu Shen to the bedroom on his back, asked the servants for hot water, took off his outer robe for him and wiped his hands and face clean, and helped him lie down in bed. Once that had been sorted out, Fu Shen destroyed the bridge behind him, driving Xiao Shun away. Get busy. Have them leave a gate open for you tonight. There are side rooms all over the rear courtyard. Sleep wherever you want. Forgive me for being an inattentive host. Seeing an expression of weariness that could hardly be concealed on his face, Xiao Shun said nothing further. He tactfully left. The pill from this afternoon had a powerful soporific effect. In order to deal with the crowd at the capital barracks, Fu Shen had held out not sleeping on the road. Now, at last, he could hold out no longer. Practically as soon as Xiao Shen had shut the door and left, he dropped right into a dizzy dream. 
The old servant listened at the window for a while with his ears pricked up until he heard long, even breaths coming from inside, at which point, tiptoeing and clinging to the wall, he left the inner courtyard and had the cook prepare some easy-to-digest porridge and snacks and keep them warm on the stove for when their master awoke. Fu Shen had traveled light and entered the capital openly. News quickly spread and reached the palace and the ears of the courtiers, but presently there shouldn't be anyone coming to pay him a visit, so the old servant, after seeing off Xiao Shun and the others, shut the front gate, leaving only a side gate open. But when Fu Shen had been asleep less than two hours, all of a sudden, urgent and forceful knocking came from outside the Marquises of Jin Ning's manor. Ah, I sense a second protagonist approaching. Hmm, who could be knocking at the door? Is it a love interest? The porter didn't dare to slight whoever this was. He hurried inside to report their presence. The old servant, the only one in the house who could make a decision, came in a rush, dragging his not very nimble legs. He looked out and was dumbfounded by the crowd outside. Black-clothed men with swords hanging from their waists astride large horses. He quaked with terror. Might, might I be so bold to ask, gentlemen? The crowd parted automatically, and a tall man came through it, who stopped his horse in the light outside the shadow of the eaves. Instantly, the cloud pattern on his dark blue clothing flashed like flowing water. The celestial horses embroidered in silver on the back of his outer robe fluttered their wings as though ready to take flight. Moonlight and lantern light illuminated a beautiful face with smiling eyes and thin lips. No need to panic, Grandfather. He nodded politely in greeting, but his tone and manner were indelibly proud and self-important. The Fei Long Guard's Imperial Investigator Yan Shaohan, acting on orders from His Majesty, comes on purpose to engage a renowned physician to examine the Marquis of Jin Ning's injuries. Please go on ahead and announce my arrival. The old servant couldn't tell apart the colors of official robes, but he'd spent decades as a servant in two noble residences. He was very familiar with the name Yan Shaohan. His heart lurched. Stalling, he said, Well, my master's had a long journey and he's injured. He's already gone to sleep, Your Honor. Why not? The Fei Long Guard had always been peremptory in action as well as and was well known to the court and the commons, and rare were those who dared stand in their way. Yan Shaohan gave the servant a lofty glance from on high. The hand holding the reins was pale and gaunt. His sleeve was rolled back, revealing a small length of ice-cold wrought iron wrist guard. With a not-quite smile, he asked, "'What? Are you very scared of me seeing your Lord Marquis, grandfather?' He had it right." This was no secret in the capital. Commander of the left Shanwu Corps, the Fei Long Guard's Imperial Investigator Yan Shaohan, was the most blazingly authoritative minister the capital had seen in recent years. He was the court's lackey, whom everyone wished to avoid, the emperor's eyes and ears. Even worse, he and the Marquis of Jin Ning were, practically oppo were naturally opposed. They had been at odds for a long time, a pair of unshakable sworn enemies. Certainly that won't be shaken. It was said a fight was sure to break out wherever they met. Not even the Emperor could stop them. Just this year, in mourning court three months ago, due to differing views on the court dispatching army observers to all points, they'd actually spent an hour deriding each other without swear words, right in front of all the ministers, and had nearly come to blows then and there. The Emperor had been so angry, he'd pounded his inkstone and dedu deducted half a year of each of their salaries, and then quickly chased Fu Shen back to the northern border before finally letting it go. Fortunes rise and fall. Now Fu Shen had returned to the capital in dejection while Yan Shaohan remained high-ranking and powerful. If he should harbor private resentment, how could the Lord Marquis take it in his condition? The old servant was anxious. There was terror in his face. I would not dare. It is only that our Lord Marquis really cannot bear any excitement. I hope your honor will make allowances. As they spoke, Yan Shaohan had surveyed the Marquis of Jin Ning's manor. The courtyard was tidy and desolate. Signs of the servant care was apparent, but it still seemed deserted. He gave a veiled sigh. Yielding, he said, I'm not here to make trouble for him. Forget it. No need for you to announce it. I'll just go in and have a look at him, then go. However persistent the old servant might be, the weak cannot overpower the strong. He had to give way. Hoisting a lantern, he went on ahead as a guide. Yan Shaohan left the Feilong guards who'd accompanied him in the forecourt to avoid giving rise to any misunderstandings with his muster of forces, only bringing with him into the inner courtyard a spare and mild young man with the look of a scholar. 
The enormous manor was absolutely empty. There were some trees growing in the courtyard. If it wasn't swept for a time, fallen leaves would cover the steps. It was as if the whole capital's bleak autumn mood had fallen in this courtyard. It was dark now. The other courtyards were silent and vacant, completely dark. Only in the windows of the main building did a pale gleam appear, giving it a rather dreary look. Yan Shaohan could restrain himself, but the young man walking beside him was already shaking his head repeatedly. Quietly, he asked, With the Marquis of Jin Ning's high birth and great merit, how could his home be? The old servant felt this deeply. He heaved sigh upon sigh. The Lord Marquis is always away, defending the border. He doesn't come home for years, and there is no virtuous lady in the house to preside over the housework and manage the household. If only he knew the virtuous lady just walked right in. There's only us old wretches left. We cannot ease the Lord Marquis's burdens. As he chattered on, he reached out to open the door of the main hall for the guests and asked the two of them to come and sit down. He lit all the lamps and ordered the tea served. Wait here a moment, gentlemen. I'll go speak to the Lord Marquis. Hardly had he spoken than a dull thud suddenly came from the west inner room as if something heavy had dropped from a height. The old servant's hand trembled. Before he could react, the Phalong Guard's imperial investigator, who'd been standing beside him, moved like the wind. In the blink of an eye, he was inside the inner room. How bad would it be if I just stopped right there? <laughs> like, they finally meet. Ha! For, uh, hello, folks. For those joining us, we are reading an ancient historical Chinese political drama centered on two gay dudes who are, don't know they're gay yet, but they're getting there. <laughs> One, Yan Shaohan, the right arm of the emperor, the morally gray pol politician, and the other, the upright noble general who defends the, the common folk at the battlefield. He is now disabled and badly injured, and Shaohan has shown up to check on him. Chapter 3. Fu Shen's sleep wasn't very restful. The medicine he'd taken had countless side effects, palpitations, nightmare, shortness of breath, a feeling between sleeping and waking as if a big stone were pressing down on his chest, and he would know how that feels. Inability to move, dizziness, and tinnitus, precisely the symptoms of a ghost pressing on the bed, as spoken of among common people. While Fu Shen hadn't himself woken up yet, his mind was clear. He silently slowed his breathing, trying to blink. Only when he could control his eyelids again did he press his hands against the bed, planning to sit up. But he'd forgotten his legs were still paralyzed, utterly without sensation from the knee down. His arms and abdomen exerted force simultaneously, but because the strength he used was too great, his center of gravity was unsteady. He turned over and fell off the bed with a thump. The bed in the bedroom wasn't particularly tall, but it had a footstool next to it. When Fu Shen fell, he first knocked against the footstool with his abdomen, then fell face up on the ice-cold tiles. The back of his head made a dull thump, hitting hard enough to make his vision darken and his ears buzz incessantly. But before he could feel the dull ache, the bedroom door was kicked open. Someone charged inside and picked him up in his arms. This person's sleeves were still suffused with the chill of the autumn night, but his palms were burning hot. Fu Shen was picked up, his head resting against this person's chest, his face pressed against a dark blue brocade official robe. The material felt soft and smooth. From the collars and sleeves came a mild and even agarwood scent. This seemed to be a person very familiar to him, suddenly become strange from too close proximity. His scorching breath soaked through the thin fabric, so hot it made that person's body tense abruptly. Then he was put back on the bed. A slightly rigid hand pressed against his forehead. Why is your breath so hot? Are you feverish? His blurred gaze and the pain he felt gla gradually clarified. Fu Shen recognized him. His first movement was to push the hand away. What are you doing here? The old servant and the young Fei Long guard bringing up the rear heard this cold, harsh question as soon as they came in and came to a halt in unison, thinking to themselves that the rumors were indeed substantiated. Neither of these two was easy to deal with. If a fight started, they would have to first hold back Yan Shaohan. Yan Shaohan closed his eyes and breathed. He didn't want to pick a quarrel with Fu Shen. Stiffly, he said, you're about to be cooked. Get up and drink something. I'll have someone feel your pulse and prescribe additional medicine. Fu Shen, eyes closed, listlessly responded, no need to take the trouble. Let's move on to business. Lord Yan has graced my humble abode in the middle of the night. What did you wish to see me about? 
Yun Shaohan ignored him. Without leave, he went to the table, picked up a tea kettle, and poured half a cup of completely cold tea. His expression immediately turned grim. He glanced coldly at the old servant. Is this the quality of your service? Pained, Fu Shen said, That's enough. Yan Shaohan said, The Lord Marquis's body is a precious one. How can he receive such lax treatment from you? If you continue to be this careless, do not blame me for reporting it to his majesty so he can dispense punishment. You don't know yet, but I am his wife, and I'm going to yell at the help for making cold tea. Fu Shen's fingers, fallen at his side, twitched imperceptibly. How could the old servant endure such a fright? He qu quickly knelt and begged for mercy. Fu Shen truly couldn't take the disturbance. He yielded at last, saying, Fine, thank you for disciplining my servant, Lord Yan. These words sounded as though they were mocking him for being a busybody. Yan Shaohan took the opportunity to disengage. He icily spat out the words, Bring fresh tea. Then at last magnanimously allowed the servant to leave. Only three people remained in the room. Yan Shaohan stood by the bed, head bent to look at Fu Shen. The bedside lamp wasn't bright enough. Half of Fu Shen's face was plunged into shadow, making its outlines appear especially deep and sharp. He was truly skin and bones, and yet at the same time also truly unrivaled in loveliness. So lovely it was even a little dazzling. Yan Shaohan smiled. There was very false sincerity in that smile. The Emperor is thinking of the Lord Marquis. His Majesty heard you'd return to the capital and particularly ordered me to bring someone here to feel your pulse. Eyes half closed, Fu Shen said weakly, Pass on my thanks to His Majesty for his care. Go back and report I'm well. I have already been treated by the Bayan Army's military doctor. There's no need to trouble the Imperial physicians. The word in the capital was that the Marquis of Jin Ning was headstrong and self willed, impervious to persuasion or threats. This was indeed true. Shen Yise, the Fei Long Guard's military doctor, who had accompanied Yan Shaohan, stepped forward. Out of a physician's kind-heartedness, he was planning to counsel this stubborn general on behalf of his superior. But Yan Shaohan raised a hand to stop him, indicating for him to wait. The expression that inadvertently appeared on his face looked as if he was dealing with some troublesome, ferocious beast. His Majesty is concerned about the Lord Marquis's injuries. I have come here today to set His Majesty's mind at ease. Yan Shaohan kept his gaze fixed on Fu Shen's profile, biting off his words crisply and slowly. To gain the Lord Marquis's trust, this military doctor of the Bayan army must have superb medical skills. I have no fear of a misdiagnosis. It is only that the Lord Marquis's injuries are of the utmost importance. There isn't any harm in getting some other doctors to have a look, don't you think? Fu Shen raised his eyelids, meeting his gaze. When Yan Shaohan met that gaze like cold iron, he felt a chill at heart. He suddenly had a strange impression, as though Fu Shen were looking through him to fix his eyes coldly on another person. After a moment, the impervious Marquis of Jin Ning lowered his eyelids, casually gathered up his messy hair, and feebly extended a hand, indicating for Yan Shaohan to help him up. Since you're already here, I'll have to trouble you. Go on. Shen Yise, startled, but Yan Shaohan didn't seem to notice anything amiss. To be able to order the Fei Long Guard's Imperial Investigator around like his own maid, Fu Shen might well have been the first. Yan Shaohan helped Fu Shen up and turned to sit at the bedside. Afraid the headboard would rub against his injuries, he braced an arm behind his back, distantly circling his shoulders to keep him from sliding down. Precisely because of this movement, Fu Shen's hair fell loose. Yan Shaohan pulled him close and tucked the strands of hair that had fallen before his eyes behind his ears. Like this, Fu Shen ended up mostly in his arms. The Marquis of Jin Ning, probably thinking his cushion was softer than the headboard, didn't bother about how repulsive Yan Shaohan himself was. Shifting and wriggling, he found himself a comfortable position and lay still. For a pair of sworn enemies, this posture unavoidably seemed too intimate. Luckily, Shen Yise's only concern was for Fu Shen's injuries. He didn't notice how the Imperial Investigator, whose names could make all the officials blanch considerably, pulled up the quilt to bundle the Marquis of Jin Ning entirely. While the Marquis of Jin Ning relaxed his tense back under the quilt and leaned his whole weight on Yan Shaohan. Ah, enemies. I, too, love to bask in the warm embrace of my hated rival. Fu Shen was, in fact, running a terrible fever, and he had just taken a fall. Everywhere hurt. 
He wasn't actually such a fragile person, but Yan Shaohan, having seen his fill of willow branch trembling in the wind, officials and nobles, had probably taken him for another easily broken vase and was treating him accordingly. The Lord Marquis is injured. Your constitution isn't what it once was. You must take care not to get chilled, and you must not consume cold or otherwise stimulating foods. No Cheetos. Your bedroom must be protected against cold and damp. The weather is growing colder. A brazier and scenting frame ought to be lit early. Shen Yise finished taking his pulse, let go of Fu Shen's wrist, and added, Pardon the offense, Lord Marquis, I need to have a look at your leg injuries. Yan Shaohan silently lifted the quilt and rolled up his pant legs for him. As he did so, he couldn't avoid touching him. As if he'd noticed something, Fu Shen shot him a strange look. He remembered very well that Yan Shaohan didn't get sick at the sight of blood. Why was he shaking? I wonder why he's shaking at the sight of your terrible injury. Oh, I wonder if he could be concerned. Though Fu Shen couldn't feel pain now, Shen Yise was still as gentle as possible. The external wounds have healed very well. Your fever comes from being affected by the cold. The Lord Marquis's most serious injuries are to the kneecaps and veins. It will take several years of slowly building back your strength before there can be hope of recovery, but I'm afraid that in the future you will have some difficulty standing and walking. Yan Shaohan rolled Fu Shen's pant legs back down for him and bundled him in the quilt. Shen Yise put away his wrist cushion. I will write out an additional prescription for the Lord Marquis. First, we will treat your cold. As for the wounds to your legs, continue treatment according to the methods of the Bayan Army's doctor. Permit me to consult with the Imperial physicians and court physicians when I return so as to draw on the collective pool of wisdom. Perhaps we will be able to come up with a better method. Fu Shen was nodding and then suddenly sucked in a breath. <sighs> Gently, hmm? Shen Yise said. It's nothing. Fu Shen clenched his teeth and flexed his shoulders, which Yan Shaohan had been gripping hard enough to hurt. I love how the story is like telling you very subtly that they do care about each other through body language. What they say does not truly show how they feel. The body language reveals it. Yan Shaohan is tense. He's upset by the sight of the injuries. He cares about Fu Shen's safety. Not at all, Shen Yi Se. Uh, he nodded and expressed his thanks. I appreciate you taking the trouble, Mr. Shen. Not at all, Shen Yi Se sidestepped the gratitude. My medical skills are inadequate. I was unable to ease the Lord Marquis's burdens. I'm truly ashamed. You mustn't be like this, Mr. Shen. Fu Shen was the most carefree one among them. I'm well aware of the condition of my injuries. It remains only to do what one can and leave the rest to heaven. Set your mind at ease, Lord Marquis, Yan Shaohan said abruptly. Heaven always leaves a way out. There has to be a way to heal your injuries. Then to Shen Yise, he added, Give the prescription to the Marquis Manor's servants. Tell them to decoct the medicine. If they lack any ingredients, they can send someone out to buy them, and if they can't find them, they can come to my manor to get them. Shen Yise saw the two of them seemed to have something to say to each other, so he saluted Fu Shen and went to follow his lord's orders. Yan Shaohan helped him to lie back down, expression unfathomable. His features were naturally gentle and sincere. Nothing in his face showed he was the one who had just squeezed the firm and unwavering General Fu hard enough to make him yelp. At last, only the two of them remained in the room. Yan Shaohan pulled over a round stool and sat far away from him. Your legs. Didn't we just discuss that? It is what it is. Fu Shen extended a hand and interrupted him. Pour me a cup of tea. Yan Shaohan frowned. It's cold. I'll take it anyway, or am I supposed to die of thirst? Fu Shen said. Similarly, even with broken legs, I still have to live. Am I going to hang myself over such a thing? Yan Shaohan had no answer to this. All he could do was spill out the half cup of old tea and pour a fresh cup and then pass it to him. His majesty had his doubts. That's why he deliberately sent me to bring someone to examine your injuries. Then he can set his mind at ease now, said Fu Shen. Not necessarily, Yan Shaohan said bluntly. You're still breathing, aren't you? Ah, he's talking about it. Remember, this all started with a plot to kill Fu Shen. Who has reason for him to be dead? Who wants him dead? This has all been building up to Fu Shen is very popular with the people. He's a very successful military general. A very large army is loyal to him. The emperor is afraid of him. Suddenly someone attempts to murder him and he's badly injured. Oh, I wonder who it could be. <laughs> Not the emperor. <laughs> Fu Shen looked at him with a you're goading me again expression. I keep thinking that none of this is real. Do you really not have some backup plan? Yan Shahan asked. You didn't release false information? 
Fu Shen asked in turn, why would you think that? Yan Shahan candidly answered, because you have a clever face. You don't look like you'd do such a stupid thing. It's true, Fu Shen shook his head and drank the tea unhurriedly. The spear in the open is easily dodged. The hidden arrow is hard to avoid. If you think I can't be taken in, you must consider me much too miraculous. Yan Shahan hadn't expected his self-assessment to be so low. He was momentarily startled. Serving in the army since his youth, accomplishing a series of illustrious military exploits, Fu Shen's existence seemed to be for the purpose of smashing the concept of impossible. In the hearts of many, the Marquis of Jin Ning and the Bayan Calvary were already an unbeatable legend. This vision struck too deep a chord in the heart. Even Yan Shahan himself had such an illusion. But Fu Shen was an ordinary man. He didn't have three heads and six arms, copper skin and iron bones. A flesh and blood body couldn't resist a boulder falling out of the sky. Do you know, on the road back to the capital, I talked to some people in a ki tea kiosk. I heard them say there's a ballad going around in the capital called With Commander Fu in the North, the capital can sleep easy. Fu Shen said, It's ridiculous. I've spent seven or eight years at the northern border. I thought I had a distinguished career, protecting the border and bringing peace to the people. I was so arrogant I was about to forget my own name. Only at the end did I learn that it wasn't only the Tartar and the Je who'd been losing sleep because of me. Even that gentleman couldn't sleep easy because of the trouble I've been making. Yan Shaohan said, Since you understand it all now, then why not simply surrender your authority, quietly go home, and retire and farm? Isn't being an idle nobleman far better than going into battle or intriguing in the capital? That's just about enough now, Fu Shen sneered. Is this your first day knowing me? I thought that at any rate we'd exchanged our inner thoughts despite being little acquainted, yet you're trying this ploy on me? He quietly continued, the Eastern Tartars won't give up their design. The Je clan watches us covetously, and how many people at court have had their vision obscured by years of peace? If I go now, who will come to take over the Bayan cavalry? Who will be willing to haggle with the court for the sake of the border army? When the enemy is at the gates, won't the misfortune fall on the common soldiers, the innocent people? What's that got to do with you? Fu Shen abruptly raised his eyes. He seemed not to have expected Yan Shaohan to turn hostile this fast. Yan Shaohan coldly said, His majesty fears you, the ministers suspect you, the ignorant masses follow the trend. Now you're like this, who still thinks of you? You hardly have a place to shelter, yet you still have the room in your heart to embrace the nation? Don't you think that's ridiculous, General Fu? These words were cold and heartless, profoundly offensive. But contrary to Yan Shaohan's expectations, Fu Shen didn't retort. Yan Shaohan watched his profile, eyes cast down and deep in thought, and suddenly had a distinct realization that the youthful brashness, the keen and dazzling edge that had once been Fu Shen's were now continuously growing faint. Pain, hardship, and experience, or something else, were thoroughly, utterly washing them away. There was a distance between them, but their manners were much more open than before, nearly amounting to laying one's heart bare. The two of them, in fact, did not get along, but they were far from being unable to stand each other as the rumors in the outside world had it. They'd met as teenagers, and being so-called sworn enemies was only them going with the flow of a misunderstanding. After all, one was a powerful official holding military authority, and one was a highly trusted aide of the emperor. If they got on too well, it would have made people suspicious. The play-acting of a tacit understanding and the intimate exchanges amid their slight acquaintance admittedly did away with quite a bit of trouble, yet this also metamorphosized certain disagreements into chasms that lay between the two of them. Many generations of the Fu family had been noble and meritorious. The men of Fu Shen's father and grandfather's generation had all died on the battlefield. Duty and loyalty were practically his nature carved into his bones and blood. Yan Shaohan, however, was of humble birth and had stepped on countless people to climb to his current position. He obeyed only the emperor's word, disregarded principle, and had no bottom line. He absolutely couldn't um comprehend these men of integrity who would undertake a career where they were sure to lose, would even practically rush to lay themselves down. In the end, they weren't traveling the same path. The two of them had perhaps long anticipated this. But they hadn't thought the clash would come so suddenly, nor that such a high price would have to be paid. So now we've got the setup. Our main hero, Fu Shen, is a general defender of the common folk, 
who has become so powerful the Emperor fears him. And so the Emperor has set up a trap for him, trying to kill him, but he's only managed to injure him badly. Well, now he's injured, he can't control his army, he's been betrayed by his leader, he has no family, he has no one to take care of him, he's all alone. But he does have this rival who shows up and says, hey, you know you've pissed off the Emperor, right? Why don't you just retire and think about yourself? The whole story is this duality of the man that's willing to literally destroy himself for the country and the people that don't seem to care for him, and the man who is entirely about selfish motivations, who's suddenly going to go out of his way to defend someone else, who's going to essentially start showing a new side of himself in defending this person who he very, very much disagrees with, has a very different morality, but he cares about him. And we're going to see that relationship develop as the two, the, the man, the general with principles and the politician with gray morals fall in love. Clearly they're halfway there already, they just don't know it. And there's a lot of politics and other things that are going to get in the way first. I really love this story and the way it weaves all those themes and things together so tightly, so well. It's one of my favorite books, and I'm really glad it's now officially released. If you would like a copy, uh, Peach, Peach Flower House. I believe there are e-books. I think you can get it digitally, but there's also the physical copies. The entire book's been translated, so you can read it all now. Uh, we will continue it. I think maybe once a week we'll do this book. Uh, we're going to read other books that we've already started and finish those up another time. Uh, continue uh, Grandmaster, Demonic Cultivation, Scum Villain, and Heaven Official's Blessing uh, later this week. I'm thinking maybe two, three readings a week. I did really good today. I still feel like I could keep reading, but I don't want to. I don't want to push it. But I feel like my, my lungs are recovering, getting stronger. So I think we're going to be able to do readings more, and that'll be fun. Uh, I don't know that they'll all be this late. Though it was kind of fun doing, like, an evening, like, a bedtime story. Maybe, like, 7 o'clock or something. We might do bedtime stories. That might be fun. Um, we are going to do more game streams. Unfortunately, my graphics card... Not my graphics card. My capture card's dead. Uh, so I guess I'm stuck with PC game, which isn't bad, but, like... You know, I'm still figuring out this new PC and what it can run, so I don't know what we'll play. Uh, we'll figure something out and play it sometime soon. I don't know when. Uh, schedules during the holidays are always hard. Uh, this month has multiple birthdays and holidays, and I may be traveling out of town twice. So we'll see about scheduling. But I'm going to try and at least stream a couple times, have a couple videos up. Thanks for watching. Uh, this will be up on the book channel. Uh, I have multiple channels now. The archive channel has all my game streams and my vlogs. The book channel has book readings. So check those out, and I will see you guys next time. Bye!